Greetings everyone, welcome to the fourth episode of Strategic Talk where we talk to experts about how they see certain issues and what's their point of view. So let's move to today's episode. We have Mr. Mrugang Busari with us. He is joining us from Boston. He is currently working at the Geoeconomic Center at Atlantic Council as a program assistant. Hi Mrugang, how are you? I'm doing great, how are you? Thank you, thanks, thanks so much for asking. Uh, today on a strategic talk, we will be talking about the impact of coercive economic tools and <coughs> relations, the case of sanctions. Economic statecraft is usually deployed to exercise economic power. Economic techniques of statecraft are often used of not accused of not working, which raises the question of how useful these actually are. So, Mr. Murugan, can you tell us about some of these tools of economic statecraft and how they are used? Yeah, so I'll begin by clarifying what economic statecraft is. Economic statecraft refers to the financial and regulatory tools that states can use to influence the behavior of other states, uh, as well as non-state actors in, uh, in global politics. So really economic statecraft lies at the intersection of foreign policy and, uh, and economics. And economic statecraft has a long history uh, in international relations. For instance, we've seen the usage of, um, uh, of trade embargoes, of uh, asset freezes, financial sanctions, as well as the threat of uh, disinvestment amongst, us, uh, amongst others. And so what we do see now, though, in, in recent years, in the last decade, they've become a lot more prominent. For example, with uh, President Trump's repeated declarations of a trade war against China, which really amounted to uh, tariffs, quotas, and a bunch of all sorts of other trade restrictions, as well as the tightening of the sanctions regimes against North Korea, against Iran, and especially right now with everything that's going on in Afghanistan, uh, where there is no longer any military leverage that uh, foreign powers have in the in the country, there a lot of them are turning to economic tools and what kinds of economic instruments can be used to use to have some leverage. And so, economic sanctions have become uh, part of the mainstream discourse again. And the way that economic sanctions work is that you try to restrict the access to resources, networks, and assets of specific individuals and entities. Such so that they are squeezed and they are at least brought to the negotiating table. And in the best case, um, they do what you want them to do in that they act and that act, sanctions act as a coercive instrument. Uh, but uh, economic statecraft, as you define, is intentionally broad since it has to include all economic forms of influence. However, this distinction can be made between negative sanctions and positive sanctions, as well as trade and financial sanctions. So how effective are these sanctions as a coercive or deterrent? Yeah, you're right that, course, uh, that sanctions are designed to be coercive instruments, which means that when state A employs uh, sanctions against state B, it wants state B to do some specific actions after which it will delist uh, those sanctions. But in reality, Sanctions also likely work as deterrents, and which makes measuring the success of sanctions extremely difficult because the, the success might take the form of things that just never happened. For instance, um, for instance, sanctions when financial sanctions may not have been effective in uh, bringing about an inclusive in, an inclusive government in Afghanistan, but they might have prevented the Taliban from being a lot more brutal, from being a lot more violent. And uh, the threat of sanctions and the escalation of sanctions might have done that. So it's really difficult to know exactly how successful sanctions are or how effective sanctions are, because they're also working in tandem with a lot of other tools of statecraft. But by and large, sanctions are effective when they have enough force to really hurt the other, uh, the other party, when they are targeted against specific actors and individuals and entities. And when, they are, when the threat of sanctions is credible in that the other side really believes that um, these sanctions can hurt and there's a real threat of escalation. And when they're coordinated on a broader scale because one country's sanctions are unlikely to by itself be very effective unless the, that one country has a lot of leverage, a lot of economic power. So, the practice of economic sanctions is hardly new in the international relations, but while the majority of the sanctions employed previously were 
unilateral. Today, they're predominantly multilateral or imposed by the United Nations. So this reflects a belief that a new and inexpensive weapon against small and medium-sized troublemakers has been found. So how these sanctions can, sanction policies can bring balance in economic pressure or how can, uh, how can it impact the humanitarian ends, for example, in Afghanistan? Yes, so in Afghanistan, I will, I'll begin by stating that the humanitarian crisis is extremely severe, that the problems, that, the humanitarian problems that are really bad at the moment. In fact, um, they face the triple shock of COVID-19, the conflict, as well as a really bad drought. So the GDP in Afghanistan is expected to con uh, contract by 10 to 20 percent in the next year. And um, more than half the population is facing uh, food shortages. There is a medicine shortage. So the problem is really bad. And so economic sanctions in, in Afghanistan are really disrupting day to day life and really disrupting humanitarian um, action within the within the country because so the, the UN as you mentioned multilateral uh, sanctions the UN has sanctions against the uh, uh, the Taliban's access to billions of dollars in Afghan gold uh, foreign currency reserves and assets that are parked in the US the IMF has blocked uh, the, the Taliban's access to hundreds of millions of dollars in a special drawing rights payments. And so the Taliban has no access uh, to foreign, to, to international uh, trade right now. It's really difficult for them to engage in international trade. At the same time, governance has costs and the Taliban has, no, has really little resources internally to govern Afghanistan at the moment. So what this really means ultimately is that the Afghan people suffer because they don't have access to the basic needs and necessities that they have. Now, having said that, the, all, all sanctions that are listed by the UN, they make exceptions for the humanitarian actors to conduct their activities. And uh, most countries also have exceptions for humanitarian actors, but that is simply not a sustainable model um, over a longer period to provide basic necessities to the, the civilian population. So as foreign governments really determine what to do regarding the situation in Afghanistan, and as they look to economic sanctions as a tool, they must recognize that while the Taliban threatens the fundamental freedoms and the fundamental ways of life of Afghans, of the civilians, sanctions and at the escalation of more sanctions will really threaten their material well-being and their day-to-day well-being in life. So I think that is something that they must look at. These sanctions cannot in their current form last forever. So they need to be, so as governments design sanction policies, they need to be very intent, intentional about what is the exact purpose of these sanctions? What do we want? What behavior do we want to get from the Taliban? Is it women's empowerment? Is it an inclusive government? Is it um, ensuring that uh, the Taliban does not finance terrorist, actor, uh, terrorist actors? So we need to be very intentional about what exactly um, sanctions are purposed to do. And the one point I will add is that sanctions should not be thought of as alternatives to other forms of statecraft, because right now that is what is happening in uh, Afghanistan is that now that there's no military leverage, we're looking at other forms of uh, statecraft, but they should be really thought of as complements to other tools because it's just one other way of applying pressure on, um, on, a, on, a, on an entity. And it may not always be appropriate. It is appropriate in some, uh, in some situations, it isn't in some others. So it, there needs to be a lot more thought about where sanctions are being employed, how they're being employed, how they're being designed, amongst others. So when the government uh, talking about this, or the government are making a decision about it, what trends should we be aware of in terms of internal sanction policies from the government side? Yes, um, I think there are two trends that the two trends that I think are really interesting at the moment. The first is that since the beginning of 2021, in general, there has been a rise in the number of sanctions listed around the world. In fact, uh, the number of China sanctions listed by China has almost doubled, but China is not alone. The US, France, EU, UK, Russia, Switzerland, everyone has uh, increased the number of sanctions. 
that they that they're listing. The only entity, the only sanctions list where um, where where there are fewer uh, entities being sanctioned is the UN, and that is only because of the roadblock of the because of the veto votes at the Security Council. So the general trend in 2021 is that the number of total sanctions is increasing, and this to me suggests that there might we might see an overuse or a misuse, in fact, of sanctions because just as I mentioned earlier. we need to be very intentional about where we're using them how we're using them how who they're against how they are um interacting with other uh, tools of statecraft so i think there is a risk of misusing and overusing um sanctions that is the first trend the second is uh, specifically about china so china passed the anti foreign sanctions law uh, recently and which basically makes it illegal uh, for foreign uh, for companies to um abide by foreign sanctions against taliban and so what this means the ther- theoretically what this means is that eventually companies may be forced to choose between breaking between violating american law or chinese law and that will be a really interesting phenomenon to watch as it unravels at the moment china isn't strictly enforcing this so it seems to be a very signaling mechanism rather than a credible financial threat but it remains to be seen where it goes in the next few in the in the in the near future so about the near future where do you think the future trajectory is going the future future trajectory can be uh, in terms of south asian countries like bangladesh or india what can we see in near future for us what is yeah. there the future what the future holds for us in yeah this scenario yeah i think so economic statecraft isn't isn't a foreign to india uh, to south asia in general i think because we've seen for instance india uh, put a trade embargo on nepal 5 or 6 years ago and that really devastated the nepali economy and so there is it isn't new at the same time there are sanctions listed against uh, in against pakistan and myanmar from from other countries um, around the world so these aren't new things that have that are in south asia but they have been present but at the same time for listing sanctions it, it is really difficult to list sanctions because not only do you need to just list them you need to have a whole system for tracking them monitoring them to seeing how they are whether someone is breaking sanction rules so it isn't easy one you need to have a really broad system and network for verifying whether sanctions are being applied and the second thing is that sanctions are only effective if you have a lot of economic power and in south asia the only power that has the sort of the only country that has the sort of power to enforce sanctions effectively and to have to really hurt other actors is india with its economic size and china if it chooses to uh, apply uh, sanctions but at the moment there hasn't been any sort of indications um in from any south asian country or southeast asian country of really employing sanctions as a tool of economic statecraft just because the cost may be so high to ensuring that they work that it, it just makes them un, unattractive so this has been really interesting and a lot of different aspects we have seen in this discussion but i believe we are so close to the end of this episode the use of economic tools in statecraft and not something that can be covered in such a short time and we are overwhelmed having you here thanks a lot for joining us hope to see you more yes, in course. our next episodes thank you thank you uh, till thank then you. take care everyone and keep your eyes on our social media handles for more updates on strategic talk